Danny Shapiro grew up in Hillside, New Jersey, and now lives in Litchfield County, Connecticut, with her husband, Michael Marin, and her 11-year-old son. She's the author of five novels, most recently Black and White, and the memoir Slow Motion. She's published short stories and essays widely in historic creative writing. Devotion is her second memoir. Judith Shulevitz grew up in suburban Detroit and in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and she now lives in the Upper West Side with her husband, Nicholas Lemon, and two children who are six and eight. As an editor, she started several magazines and now writes widely as a cultural critic. The Sabbath World, Glimpses of a Different Order of Time, is her first book. Our family took trips, went on bike rides, ate dairy and fish in regular restaurants, played tennis. We did not wear the long dresses, the wigs, the black hats, the long beards or side curls that many of my cousins wear today. But still, thrumming beneath the surface, ever present, there was the sense that my father's devotion was what allowed our world to keep turning. If he stopped, if he broke even one of the elaborate set of rules by which our family lived, something terrible might happen. After all, my father had to believe in a mercurial God who could be petitioned. Otherwise, he lived in a brutal and indifferent universe, governed by no entity, no greater being. When my father wore the tefillin, closed his eyes, and davened, he was doing what he could to protect himself and those he loved. He who is accustomed to lay tefillin will live long, said Maimonides. As it is written, when the Lord is upon them, they will live. The Sabbath, I said, is not only an idea. It is also something you keep with other people. You can't just extract lessons from it. Me, I want to keep it and teach my children to keep it. But at the same time, since I grew up watching a religious mother and a skeptical father play tug of war over our upbringing in a home in which the Sabbath was largely the occasion for unspoken recriminations about how we were being raised, I'm afraid that if I impose the Sabbath on my children, they will resent me as much as I resented my parents. They will suss out signs of my ambivalence and use them as proof of my inconsistency and hypocrisy, as I did in my time. I like the idea of keeping the Sabbath, but at the thought of actually doing it, of passing an entire day following strange rules while refraining from customary recreations, I am knocked flat by a way of anticipated boredom. How does time and schedule play out in your life? It sounds like you have a regular routine that you try to keep up that's part of your practice. You know, typically, much of my early, the early part of my day does involve um, a series of practices, at least if I'm going to have a good day. Um, I don't check any kind of email or get on, on the computer until my son has gone off to school because I'm increasingly interested in the whole idea of split attention or fragmented attention and I realize how much of my days and how much of my time and particularly how much of my time as the mother of a young child I'm spending with multiple things going on in my head which means that I'm not really there. She was just reacting to you about time, but I wonder, what do you do? For instance, on Shabbat, how do you just shut all that noise um, off around? Well, we just, we do, we are, I am not, you know, can strictly show my Shabbat, but we do turn that stuff off. Um, and uh, it is, the, the splitting of attention is actually, it's, as, as we all know, it's become, in fact, a threat to us on the road. Um, and it's become really one of the problems of our society because you are actually less efficient when you, when you multitask. Uh, given how complicated in your own, each of your childhoods um, Judaism was, I'm wondering how you see your children's experience. I think you can't be fake with your kids. So my kids know that, uh, you know, mommy's more observant than daddy. Um, and, uh, you know, but there are things that dad is more into, like, we do, we do, um, Parshat HaShavua at home before we go to Shul, because of course Shul is really just a play for my kids, and we do a little bit of Parshat HaShavua, and he's very serious about it, more than I am. I am like, let's get off to Shul, and he's very, very serious about that. Um, 
And, you know, life is complicated, and people are different, and maybe there's a value to their realizing that you know, there's not a unit, one way or an all or nothing way to religion, and people work it out, but they work it out the way we're living, the, we're working it out in the context of the community where everyone else is working it out too. I would say just in the last few years, the sense that I have, um, you know, when I pick my son up at, at, at Hebrew school and he's in the back of the car and he's singing, uh, you know, he's singing the Adon Alum or he's singing the Bar Hulu, he's singing whatever they've learned, uh, you know, that, that day, um, is precious to me. But I also don't want him to necessarily um, feel um, a sense that, uh, of, of, of pushing him in a way. I mean, he, he, he now, he, he wants to be bar mitzvah, he's excited about this process, um, and I think what he feels in our home is a sense that, you know, very much that we're a Jewish family and that he would identify himself probably in the first few ways that he would describe himself as being Jewish, but that that sense of it being a conflict or a, a source of pain, a, a, something fraught, is it was something very much I didn't want him to have to grow up feeling. The, the image in my mind that captures most of what I'd like you to address is, I, I see this over and over again on uh, Shabbat morning, a, a man wearing a talus outside on a cell phone. I th and this is oh, we see this over and over again. I feel like we're at a we're at a moment in time where we've lost. I'm wondering if you all might, including you two, Sam, might reflect on uh, how you uh, deal with the idea of the things you cannot do. We live in a society which has its structures, and things happen that are urgent and important, and are, you know you have to really arrange your life in a particular way if you're going to give up your cell phone one day out of seven, and it's a hard thing to do, and it's a hard choice to make, and it may not be the right choice for you. So one of the things that interested me are the concrete, very tangible, yet sort of reasons that have big economic explanations behind them, why it's really hard to keep this out of them, why we're losing it, in fact, as a concept, and why the blue laws run away, why time has lost all its previous institutional structures, that sort of thing. Thank you very, very much, all of you. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, the authors are going to sit over there and, and sign the books.